G'day, my name's Dev. I'm here on Larrakia country in Darwin at the top end of Australia's Northern Territory. In this episode, I'll discuss the colonisation of Southern Australia. It happened relatively late compared to other regions of the New World, and this allowed the ideas and mechanisms of the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution to power British agricultural expansion into the pure enormity of the Australian bush with great success and devastating consequences. For context, Southern Australia is the enormous bottom half of the Australian continent, including Tasmania. It is a very different world from the deserts of Centralia and the tropics of Northern Australia. Southern Australia is about the 13th largest economy on earth. It has our most productive agricultural regions and our most advanced industrial zones. Almost our entire population lives within it. Australia's great cities, Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Perth and Adelaide, are all strategically located along its temperate coastline. These core centres contain the organisations and systems that generate modern Australia's economic and cultural power. So they form the conventional Australian perspective and assert it over the outback and into the world. It is true that success is usually underpinned by luck and the history of Southern Australia is no different. The British officers who first assessed its endless coastline from the quarter decks of their sailing ships knew almost nothing about its climate and ecology, nor the ancient social geography of its first peoples. However, the strategic locations they determined for settlement became ideal juxtapositions to accept ships from the sea and then support massive agricultural expansion into the bush. It is important to remember that the British Empire was very much an agricultural empire. Everyone wanted wealth and selecting conquered farmland in the Australian colonies became a trusted method to attain it. Understandably, the available farmland in the settled districts was quickly taken up by rich settlers, so poorer immigrants and former convicts had to go deeper into the land. It is easy to forget that many of these peoples were still influenced by old world views of pre-industrial Europe. They had rituals and superstitions and a prevalence to search for herbal medicines and sacred charms in the Australian bush. So they had strange affinities with Aboriginal groups they encountered, their ceremonies, dreamtime spirits and bush medicines. Many of these poor settlers were extremely hardworking, resilient and innovative. Many of them were practicing Christians and they went into the bush with their, with their wives and their families. And so their interactions with Aboriginal people were strange, yet holistic and relatively peaceful. A good example of this is in the early 1860s, the Irish Australian pastoral pioneer, Patrick Durack, was tired of the settled districts around Sydney because they provided insufficient outlets for his ambitious nature. So he moved his extended family way out beyond the frontier to the hard channel country in outback Queensland. There were no other white people there, but there were about 25 different Aboriginal groups who had been living in the area for over 20,000 years. They had established a vast trade network that moved ochre and pitchery or bush chewing tobacco to the coasts. Patrick was amazed by them. He watched them chase down kangaroos on foot he and his family lived and worked with them for almost a decade. However, this relative harmony would not be replicated by his ambitious and unmarried Australian born sons who would subsequently push cattle into the vast regions of Northern Australia and see the traditional owners as little more than pests. This metamorphosis is well described in the book, Kings in Grass Castles, written by Patrick's granddaughter, Mary Durack. Agricultural expansion was the principal economic logic supporting the incremental colonisation of Southern Australia. The vanguard were European explorers who trekked deep into the Australian continent. They thought they'd discover an enormous inland sea, plains of plenty, or the ruined pyramids of lost civilizations. But instead, they travelled through increasingly dry and sweeping country, seemingly endless districts of potential farmland that got incrementally drier the closer to the centre of, of the continent you came. And all of it, every acre of it, belonged to different Aboriginal countries that had been living there for tens of thousands of years and developed complex ideologies and lifestyles based off a symbiotic relationship with the land. 
Australia was their world and they had shaped it. Contrary to the violence that would later characterise the Australian frontier, interactions between early European explorers and the first Australians seem mostly peaceful. I recommend you read about the mysteries of Ludwig Leichhardt, the endurance of J.M. Stewart, the capacity of Thomas Mitchell, and the experiences of Augustus Gregory and Giles. These explorers were exceptional people, but they were also spies for what was economically Britain's global agricultural empire. Consequently, they didn't stay long enough to get to know any Aboriginal people or to learn anything about culture. But they took great notes on the strange environment that surrounded them. As they travelled over seemingly endless grassy plains and gentle forests, their journals described the southern Australian bush as looking like an estate. Historians formally believe that these journal accounts were exaggerated attempts to liken the Australian bush to the English countryside. But it has since become known that the Australian bush was then the result of thousands of years of careful Aboriginal land management practices. They cultivated the seeds of medicinal plants, fertilised native fruit trees, stocked fish in creeks and built weirs to contain them. They managed their country, made sanctuaries and regulated their activities. They used fire to maintain extensive grasslands and encourage kangaroos and wallabies. In fact, the topsoil of these native plains was so soft that the wagon tracks of the explorers remained visible to those who followed for many years to come. Thomas Mitchell called it Australia Felix, meaning happy or lucky Southland, and it encouraged Russia squatters. Aboriginal peoples living traditionally in the bush for tens of thousands of years have become part of the ecology. This is something that I don't think we could replicate again today by choice or design. Aboriginal peoples had achieved an enviable degree of balance with their environment. However, the strengths they had developed over eons of isolation became critical vulnerabilities when they encountered the annihilating forces of an expanding Europe. Along the enormous Australian frontier, the rule of law was spread very thin and ambitious whites continued to push into the bush and squat large tracts of land for agriculture. The best agricultural land was usually the best hunting grounds and this brought them into contact with the traditional owners. Aboriginal groups would regularly move as an entire demographic through their country, the old, the young, the women, the men and the children. This made them dangerously vulnerable to ambush especially from white killers who had spent a lot of time in the bush and understood Aboriginal ways and movements. Ambush became an unofficial and secret method for clearing Aboriginal people off their country to make way for cattle, sheep and wheat. It was supported by native police on the ground, sanctioned by white officers and facilitated cryptically by some colonial administrators as dispersals. This method was invented in Van Diemen's land early in the colonisation of Southern Australia, and it continued savagely around the continent until 1928, when a hundred Walpuri people were killed by a white posse at Coniston Station near Alice Springs. This was the last police sanctioned killing of Aboriginal people in Australian history. Today, the massacre and mistreatment of Aboriginal peoples is sadly evident in the formative histories of almost every region of modern Australia. It is well known that Aboriginal warriors fought like demons to protect their worlds from the invaders, but this was usually in the form of desperate guerrilla campaigns fought by small groups of women and men after their families had been decimated. In the literature, the effectiveness of Aboriginal resistance is often overestimated. Today it is known in Australia as the Frontier War, and though Aboriginal warriors did kill many whites and Chinese, and forced the abandonment of some outback settlements, they never legitimately threatened to stop colonial expansion. This strange warfare is thoroughly investigated in the book Frontier Justice by Tony Roberts. The colonisation of Southern Australia really was a fast and brutally successful conquest. Its aftermath was socially apocalyptic, environmentally disastrous, but commercially successful, and it gave birth to modern Australia. However, I don't think the complete environmental impact of Aboriginal dispossession can be fully understood. The removal of the people who had been central to Australia's ecology must have consequences that are beyond our capacity to explain scientifically 
or through history. The colonisation of Southern Australia is an extraordinary story. It started as a collection of fledgling and extremely isolated British penal settlements and grew itself up to become one of the most organised and wealthy countries on earth. However, it is also very much a story of paradise gained and paradise lost because some truly evil things happened during this monumental transition and we don't really know how to vindicate ourselves morally from them. I don't know, maybe we can't. 